So hi, uh, I'm Joseph Blasey, and uh, this is a panel in which we're going to look at employee ownership and the company uh, of the future. We're kind of, you know, push uh, the looking glass forward and uh, see what we think about really the future of the corporation. And uh, we're going to start with two of the Rutgers Institute research fellows to give us some, some perspective on some issues that they've been studying in empirical research. And first, I'd like to introduce uh, Marshall Vance, who is Associate Professor of Accounting at Virginia Tech. And then we'll talk uh, with Felice Klein, who's Assistant Professor of Management from Boise State University. Marshall. This has been a really fun and unique conference so far. So yesterday, we got to hear from US senators and representatives. Those were some really heavy hitters. But I think that the conference organizers wanted to add just a little bit more sizzle to the program. And so today on day two, you get to hear from an accounting professor. <laughs> and I know you guys are thinking, I really hope he gets into double entry accounting, bookkeeping, the joys of debits and credits. But actually, I'm going to go a different direction. Um, we'll talk after if you want to hear that stuff. Um, but I come at equity compensation or employee ownership from the perspective of what we in management accounting call control systems, which are the things that we put in place to try to encourage certain behaviors among our employees. How do we get them to do the, the right things or do the things we want them to do? And probably the most basic thing that you would, behavior that you would like to encourage your employees to do is to not quit. Right? If they quit, then you really have no say in what they do after that point. Um, and so you, you really want to try to retain employees. That's one of the key things that, that practitioners struggle with. Um, it's also one of the key things that has been argued for one of the reasons why companies use equity compensation is for retention purposes. But it turns out that it's actually a little bit difficult to really nail down in a rigorous way the relationship between equity compensation and employee retention. The reason for that is because we typically lack data, especially um, below the top levels within firms. But also, we don't usually observe really clean settings where you have a control group and a treatment group. So uh, I started uh, kind of with this, um, this issue. I was talking to the director of compensation at a large retail chain that uses an ESOP. And as he described the ESOP to me, I hadn't really been familiar to that point with broad-based equity. Um, really anything below the executive level. And I said, well, that's interesting. You're giving this to the people who are at work in the cash register and stocking shelves. Well, what does it do? And he sheepishly admitted, he said, I hope that it's helping us retain our employees, our frontline employees. And keep in mind, this is an industry where 50 to 100% turnover is the standard. I hope it's helping us retain employees, but I have no idea, and I don't think that's even testable. Well, it turned out that because of ERISA laws, there's actually a, a cool way that you can get at this, and that's because eligibility to participate in the ESOP is based on whether you work 1,000 hours. If you work 1,000 hours or more, you participate in the ESOP. If you work 999 hours, you don't. And so I use this setting to try to compare people right around that cutoff who are otherwise very similar to each other, and you can actually then control kind of flexibly for the actual number of hours that they work. And so in doing that analysis, I have found my result was that uh, participation or eligibility for the ESOP improved retention or it decreased turnover rates by about 35%, which is pretty dramatic. Um, so that, I think, helps establish or at least contributes, you know, going back to Joseph's uh, repeated point about, you know, fresh bread and, and we keep coming back to this issue. I don't think the case is closed. I don't think that's the last study on, on employee retention. It certainly won't be. Um, but it helps at least establish with a little bit of rigor kind of a causal relationship between uh, equity compensation plan and employee turnover. But I want to touch very briefly on two other issues that I think are really interesting, but also I think there are opportunities to explore much further. The first, so um, in this uh, study, I, I very briefly and kind of tangentially just examined and saw that different types of employees at different levels in the organization um, by age and by gender responded differently to the plan in terms of the effect on their turnover rates. But more broadly, there's this issue in academia that we call selection effects. So if you give somebody equity compensation, how they value that is going to be subjectively determined. It, it, what is it worth to them? 
and that can vary across different employees. So I have subsequently done some research that shows that depending on employees' risk aversion, they value these plans differently. Um, depending on kind of cultural features and especially the trust that they have in management, it can make an impact on uh, these, the plans, the effect that they have on uh, retention. So I think just thinking about this question, what kinds of employees are most likely to be attracted? What kinds of characteristics are likely to be attracted to a company that uses an ESOP, that promotes an ownership culture? What kinds of employees are likely to stay at that same company? I think that's a really interesting issue, and I think that's something that we can explore further. The second, going back to the, the study that I just mentioned, I sort of suspect, so 35% seems like a really large effect, but it may actually understate the impact of a plan in that particular kind of a setting. And this is something that came up a lot earlier, but I suspect, and, and I have reason to believe, that a lot of employees simply don't understand the plans that they were participating in. And let me just share one anecdote, because it, it was very dramatic and eye-opening to me. So I, in addition to looking at the data, I tried to get out in the field and talk to frontline employees and ask them, what do these plans mean to you? And oftentimes they would say, I don't really know what that plan is, but they would often say things along the lines of, you know, it's really nice, it's a great gesture, I like to be an owner, I feel like Warren Buffett when I'm an owner. Um, and you'd hear things like that. But one particular woman, I had a conversation with her, she'd been working there about 15 years, was making not much above minimum wage. And I, I asked her, what did she think? She says, it's really nice, it helps to contribute to this family feeling. And I said, well, how much, what is the value? How much do you have in this plan? And she thought, she's like, I'm not sure, but I think it's probably a couple thousand dollars, two or three thousand. And when I retire, you know, it's a retirement plan, so I can't access it now, but when I retire, I hope I'll use that to maybe go to Disneyland or go on a vacation. I said, you know, that's really nice, right? That's a nice thing for a company to give you, uh, go to Disneyland in, in 30 more years or something like that. But I was like, is that right? So I went back at, to the data when I got back to my office and I looked and she had over $50,000 in this plan. And so she appreciated that she owned something, but she was off by an order of magnitude. And so if we're trying to get at retention incentives or a feeling like you actually have a stake in the business, again, this is a theme that was touched on, but I really think there's a lot more to be done on engagement and actually understanding of the plan. It's not just are you in the plan, but do you know that you're in the plan and do you know what that means? And so I think there is a lot of evidence on uh, this relationship between employee ownership and retention. I think we've established a baseline. I think we have some good reasons to believe that it might be a causal relationship. But I think two important issues that we can continue to look at are the selection effects. What kinds of employees does this bring into and does it keep into our companies? Um, as well as thinking about what are the impacts of retention? How do we, or of uh, engagement and knowledge, how do we get these people, especially on the front lines where education and, and other factors of, of engagement might be low, how do we get them to really understand and buy into this? So I love this conference and these kinds of conferences because it brings together academics and practitioners. And I think that when we work together and collaborate, we're in a great position to be able to tackle some of these really interesting research issues going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. Uh, the next um, Rutgers Institute fellow will be Felice Klein. Felice is an assistant professor of management at Boise State University, and she's gonna give us uh, another dimension on this. Thank you, Felice. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? Okay, it's great to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk about something a little different than I think most people talked about um, during this conference. I'm gonna talk about stock and stock options that employers give, and particularly I'm gonna talk about the gender gap in equity-based awards, stock and stock options. So we know that women tend to earn less, right? That's probably not shocking to anyone at this conference. We've seen this in a large literature. But most of this research focuses on more traditional forms of pay, salary as well as bonuses. And so in a recent paper that I published with some co-authors, we sought to understand, does a gender gap exist in equity-based awards? And you know, I'm probably speaking to the choir here, 
Um, Equity-based awards can be a substantial portion of employees' total compensation in, in some firms, like tech firms, some startups. Um, it also can have huge implications on employees' wealth. So it's really important to understand, does a gap exist? So in this paper, we sought to understand two main questions. Does a gender gap exist in equity-based awards? And if so, why does it exist? And to do this, we, we obtained data from two tech firms, a large publicly traded tech firm and a small startup, as well as we looked at executive pay and we ran an experiment to understand the, the mechanism. And what did we find? We found even after accounting for the traditional reasons women earn less, that they're in lower paid occupations, they may have less experience than men, we found that the gap, women receive 15 to 20 percent fewer equity grants in their organizations than men. And the value was 20 to 30 percent lower than men. And so why does this occur? So we found two main reasons. One, which, which Marshall already got at, why equity is given out to employees. It's retention is the most common reason we heard when we spoke to executives in many firms. And this is supported in previous research. Also, how equity is given out to employees. So why equity is given out, why does that cause um, issues or in inequities? Well, first, retention risk, right? That is a very subjective reason. Managers tend to give it out based on who's most likely to leave, who's most valuable to retain. When there is subjectivity, that leads to managerial discretion, and that could lead to biases. In addition, how equity is given out. So many organizations, particularly the large ones, and I'm not saying every organization, I think we all know some organizations aren't doing this, but many organizations are seeking to address gaps in the traditional forms of pay, right? Salary and bonuses. They're running audits um, to make sure there are no gaps in fixing them. They're formalizing the payout. But many firms are not doing these same things for equity-based awards. And so what are the implications? What do we suggest of how do we solve these issues? One, organizations should, should reduce or stop providing equity based on very subjective reasons. Provide them based on more objective reasons. How long were you at the firm? Giving it to everybody who are in certain roles. In addition, they should be auditing this is something that is common in many organizations. They should be auditing the equity grants. And if they see gaps they can't explain, they should be fixing them by giving more equity to employees. In addition, um, additional research, not my own, has found that pay transparency is a great way to solve compensation gaps. So organizations can provide the ranges or even the, the means or the medians for equity, like they are doing for some some, for some forms of pay like salary. Um, and given we've talked about policy, I kind of want to bring this back to policy. A number of cities and states are actually adopting and enacting pay transparency laws. Colorado, Washington, these are even being considered in Georgia, West Virginia, Kentucky. But most of these laws focus on salary. And very few, there are a few exceptions, Washington and Colorado, focus on equity. And so if we really are serious about making equity more inclusive, then these laws that are being passed and considered should focus on all forms of pay. So that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Felice. And you'll be hearing more about Felice's research in the coming months. So I'd like to call up our panel uh, to be seated up front. Uh, Eric Foreman, co-founder uh, co of the Drivers Cooperative. You can come up as I call your name. Chris Fredericks, president and CEO of Empowered Ventures. Annalisa Miller, executive director of Ownership Works. And Robin Schutak, managing director of Infinite uh, Equity. And uh, do we have microphones up here for everybody? We do. And we have a chair for me. And uh, see if I can get it right this time. 
Okay. Well, first of all, thank you to all of our panelists for coming to the conference. And uh, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, just a, a brief presentation from each of you, about two minutes, just introducing your biography a little bit and your organization and, and what you do and why you're interested in this. So we'll start here with Chris Fredericks and we'll go to the right. Thank you, Joseph, and uh, thank you, everyone, for having us. Um, I think this has been a, an amazing conference. I think, you know, the energy around the employee ownership movement in general is just getting really exciting. Um, all the different ways people are approaching it and um, the creative ways, and this is, I guess, a panel about innovation and kind of the future. Um, but I, I don't think this represents everything that's going on at all. It's just maybe a few really interesting, hopefully interesting um, examples. So um, I'm a recovered, recovering CPA, I guess. That's, you know, uh, as many of you are. Um, and I had the opportunity in 2010 to, I was the CFO of a small business uh, near Indianapolis, a fabric distribution company. Um, the founder of the business, um, classic ESOP story, founder needed a succession plan, didn't have any family in the business, uh, was skeptical of some of the typical options, um, and he asked me to help him figure out his succession plan. So working with our accounting firm uh, as advisors and, and then eventually finding some other terrific ESOP advisors, uh, we executed a 100% ESOP buyout, and uh, I ended up stepping into the, the president role. And basically, during the 2010s, we had just a nice, a really nice run, you know, as an employee-owned company, both financially um, and in a lot of the other ways that many ESOPs, you know, experience and talk about. Um, really, the impact it had on the people was um, pretty incredible. Um, it's been life-changing, I think, for so many of them financially. Um, it's, you know, just been a lot of fun to see so many people come alive in that kind of a culture and environment where, you know, in a, some traditional, you know, corporate environments can feel stifling. A, a really great ESOP ownership culture can really, you know, bring people alive in my experience. So I personally, this has, I wasn't even familiar with ESOPs before all of this, and now it's kind of, I'm just so grateful to be part of, you know, something that can have such a big impact on people. Um, briefly, sorry, I know I'm going long. Um, we ended up transitioning to a hold code model. So in 2020, we launched a holding company, and now we're intending to continue to grow through acquisition uh, in a holding company model. We've since added a couple businesses, and we're seeking to continue to grow in that fashion. And we're going to get to some of those structural elements in the, in the next part of the discussion. But thank you very much, Chris. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Annalisa Miller, who is Executive Director of Ownership Works. Annalisa, give us an idea of what Ownership Works is trying to do and what Ownership Works is and your biography. And we'd like to get other questions to you later on. Sounds good. Hi, everybody. Um, so a little bit about me. I started my career in law and corporate finance and then public finance practice for five years and moved to the nonprofit sector where I was broadly focused on rural economic development. And that's where I was first exposed to cooperatives. Um, I was living in Hawaii at the time. And then I moved back east and was just really taken with the concept of shared ownership and latched on to employee ownership, went to Project Equity and worked with amazing colleagues in this room, and then went on to Ownership Works. And so Ownership Works is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2021 to, like all of us in the room, expand employee ownership across corporate America. Um, we've set a goal of creating at least $20 billion of wealth for workers through broad based employee ownership by 2030, and we have two main strategies to get there. The first we call movement building, which is about generating a groundswell of interest in employee ownership across the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. And the second is providing investors and companies with hands-on guidance on how to implement holistic shared ownership programs. And the movement that we're building, as a lot of you know, we work closely with private equity firms. We have now 25 private equity firms that we work with that have committed to implementing broad-based employee ownership programs in their portfolios, um, as well as partners among professional services firms, pension funds, financial institutions. So we're up and running off to a good start. There's 66 portfolio companies with programs in place reaching 95,000 employees and over $360 million that's been shared to date. So off to a good start, but a lot more to do. Thank you, Annalisa. Uh, Robin Shutak at Infinite Equity. 
how infinite is this going to become? <laughs> uh, tell us about it, infinite Wonderful equity. Wonderful question. And thank you for having me today, Dr. Blasi. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, so, and also, Felice, we must talk. I just came off a conversation about the very topic that you were covering, and there's some other really great research out there, and there's so much to be done. So hats off to you. Anyway, Robin Shutak with Infinite Equity. I'm a managing director at the firm. I have over 20 years of experience in this space. Uh, Infinite Equity is a completely employee-owned company, and our focus is on end-to-end -end equity compensation solutions, so from plan design to administration and everything in between, communications, participant education, and I, I probably held every single role within this industry as a actual corporate practitioner issuer, managing stock programs for large publicly traded companies in the San Diego area. I've also been a trainer, educator, membership director for two of the leading associations in this industry, or in the equity compensation industry. And then more recently, as a practice leader for Computer Share, a financial services firm, and now with Infinite Equity. And then in terms of Infinite Equity's work, what we do is we, our goal is to convert employees into owners of the companies that they work f work for through our equity compensation design and education and participant communication. So my focus at Infinite Equity is to help with equity design strategy and also communication. And I love it because I have seen the benefits of these programs by participating in them and then designing them. And I'll talk about a few of our clients who have done some really incredible and in innovative things. So I, I'm just so passionate about this topic. And I think just Dr. Blasey, to me, what we're here to talk about is how can we get more large publicly traded companies to be more employee owned? It's so important. Okay, thank you very much. And Eric Foreman, uh, uh, Eric is co-founder of the Drivers Cooperative. Tell us a little bit about the Drivers Cooperative and how it got created. Well, th thanks so much, Joe. And I just want to take a moment to thank Joe, Maureen, and the teams at Rutgers and the Aspen Institute. It's uh, this is an incredible room to be in. And I have to say a particular thanks because so many people in this room have been part of the success we've been able to achieve with the Drivers Cooperative, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so who are who? what is the Drivers Cooperative? Um, back in 2019, and began building this organization. We've grown now to over 9,000 drivers, including 1,800 owners. Uh, in in our first full year of operation, we generated about 5.9 million in sales and paid out 5.2 million to drivers in wages. Um, I know these are probably small numbers for a lot of folks in the room who are playing around with billions, but for going to zero to 5.9 million was an accomplishment for us. Um, and maybe mo what we're most proud of is we've been able to establish a $30 an hour minimum wage uh, in the gig economy, which is, yeah. it, Sadly, I think remains the only minimum wage in the gig economy, um, and maybe that's a topic for some of the conversation here about how to inspire some of the bigger players to, to do better. Um, but just to introduce myself a bit, um, I, 20, I, I, my, my background is in, is in labor organizing. Um, about 20 years ago, I began trying to unionize the jobs that I had in college, which were in the fast food industry. It was maybe tragically ahead of its time. Um, but uh, I will say that uh, as of last summer, the shop that I had gotten fired for unionizing, well, maybe I'll talk about that later, was, <laughs> was unionized 18 years later uh, by a different group of, completely different group of workers. But anyway, um, I, I, I'm supposed to keep this two minutes, but I guess what I'll just leave it at is that I spent um, 15 years building labor unions and through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, got f I got fired many times, all my friends got fired, uh, kept the NLRB in way more business than it ever wanted to be in. Um, you can look up all these case files if you want. Um, and what I realized after a certain period of time is, as I started to understand capitalism better, was that um, it would not be out of reach for workers to start their own companies. And then I began learning about the history of unions doing co-op housing development, of worker cooperatives. And so about now half a decade ago, I made a little bit of a pivot to entrepreneurship and began building worker-owned companies. Um, 
I thought it would be a good idea to, to diversify. So I started two at the same time, and unfortunately, they both achieved substantial. One, one is the driver's cooperative. The other is a internet service provider started by uh, workers who are on strike against Spectrum. Um, unfortunately, they both served. I, mean, I shouldn't say it that way. That's I don't want to. <laughs> that's tempting bad luck. But um, yeah, then they're both doing well. So I'm busy and uh, but excited about the enormous potential that worker ownership has to fix some of the foundational wrongs of this country. And I got to say, I love your enthusiasm about being fired. <laughs> <laughs> These were not good jobs. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to ask a question that would go right now from the you know very introductory and general level to a very specific level. Uh, maybe for you, a subsidiary for Annalisa, one of the companies that you've transformed. Hearing the story, same thing for for Robin, and I, I think it would be very good to understand the process of the creation of uh, of one of these one of the drivers cooperative and really get it down to the nitty gritty level. So uh, we'll start with Chris, and we'll still keep going to the right. Um, so yeah, I think an instructive story about kind of what we're doing. So in 2010, 2020, we founded the holding company. We started looking for businesses to add to our group. Um, the first one we came across uh, that it, we ended up, you know, being serious about uh, was a preci precision machine shop. Difficult to say that sometimes um, near Cleveland, Ohio, and it it was interesting in the way that a lot of the issues that have been talked about over the last couple of days kind of all could be seen in this one situation. So uh, it was on you know not a huge business, but a very successful uh, business. Um, the owner uh, had founded the company, needed it to sell um, soon, and um, he was concerned also, similar to the, my original story about kind of his options. And he, interestingly, he was very familiar with employee ownership in ESOPs. His wife actually had been an employee owner of the year in, that st in the state of Ohio like 20 years before. So it was very much something he was aware of, um, but he was given advice that they were not big enough and that you know it just wasn't a good fit. And I don't know that that was 100% accurate advice. And the other thing that was going on that uh, we, we've talked some about is, you know, some of the, the question about succession in terms of leadership and management. And he had, I would say he had real, a lot of confidence in his people. He cares a lot about his people, but wasn't sure that the business didn't need more support from a leadership, you know, perspective, especially in pulling off like a, an actual succession process. Um, so he was pretty far down the road of finding, you know, a buyer for the business, and then we um, got involved, and he was excited to learn about a holding company that's already employee-owned that could do a more traditional transaction in terms of acquiring the business as part of our group, um, and it being an employee ownership outcome. So when we think about businesses that are below, say, 50 to 100 employees, I think we're, we might have an opportunity to really focus on current employee-owned companies, really focusing on M&A um, to grow employee ownership. There's a lot of businesses out there that just the, the owner's not comfortable going through that whole process for a litany of reasons. Um, I think this could be an underappreciated you know, way to, to devote some attention and resources around the, the 5,000 privately owned you know, ESOPs that already exist today and have built up a lot of capabilities around ESOPs and, and running an ESOP company. Thank you. So Annalisa, can you bring us inside one of your, your interesting cases, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Charter Next Generation. They are a portfolio company of uh, KKR and Leonard Green, two of our partners, and um, they launched a shared ownership program in 2021, extending ownership to all 2,100 employees across 15 facilities. So Charter Next Generation is a manufacturer of specialty films used in um, food and medical packaging, and it's run by this fantastic CEO, Kathy Bolhouse. She's been at the company since 2010, if not earlier, and the company has performed so well under her leadership. So it went from a valuation of 58 million to 4.5 billion, um, 58 million in 2010 to four and a half billion in 2021. So she is very, very passionate about her workers and had actually advocated, she's been private equity owned four times and really wanted KKR to acquire the 
firm because she knew of the broad-based ownership program. She missed that the last time around, and now KKR is the investor. So she's really excited to launch this program. And I'll tell you a little bit about the structure and the approach at Charter Next Generation, because that's representative of the approach across the board. So the first phase is structuring and sizing the broad-based plan. And so these are, these are not ESOPs. These are um, you know, broad-based stock option programs, stock appreciation right restricted stock units. The parameters are that all full-time employees need to have a pathway to ownership. There can be eligibility requirements, like you have to be at the company for a year or something like that. And then the sizing of the grants, the target are six to 12 months of salary for full-time employees at the exit when the company sell, private equity firm um, exits the investment, assuming that investor hits their base case. So that's how the program was structured at, at Charter Next Generation. And she was super excited to launch. She launched the program. And, it fell, and, and before the launch, we said to her, do an employee engagement survey. And she pushed back really hard. And she said, oh, my, my employees are great. Like, we're fine. And she didn't want to do it. But we said, you know, this is one of the requirements of an ownership works program is that you do a pre-launch engagement survey. So she did it. And she got the survey results back. And she wouldn't mind me sharing that she's told this story publicly. She cried because her employee engagement scores were in the 18th percentile. And so she launched the program. And to no surprise, it like fell flat because the employees are like, Okay, so in five years, I might get this payout, and, and you're not really paying attention to what's happening at the company today. And they tried a few things, and after a year, Kathy really understood, I have to go talk to the employees at all 15 plants and understand why is engagement so low and why is everyone quitting. And she did that, and she finally got to the root of it. And you know, a year later, her engagement scores are up 23%, so not where they should be, but they're moving in the right direction. Her quit rate is down, voluntary quit rate is down 23%, and the financial performance is improving. Um, and so what Kathy, and we just had a conference for CEOs, and what Kathy sh shared this story, and the, what she was trying to tell the other CEOs, there were 60 CEOs, mainly of um, PE backed companies in the room. And she was trying to say to them, you know, it's not enough to size and structure this plan. You've got to build a culture of ownership. And to do that, you have to start with employee engagement. That's not all you need to do, but it's a starting point to understand that you're signaling to your employees that we're listening to you and that we're actually going to start to change the culture. So we've been working on, like so many of the folks in the room, and learning from you on how do you build a culture of ownership. We've built a playbook. We're going to be testing it. Um, but so much of what we're trying to do is, is beyond sizing and structuring the plan. It's great news. It's in 66 companies. Companies, but I think we all know it's not going to stick if the culture of ownership isn't there, where the employees feel, think, and act like owners, um, are really seen as true value creators in the journey, and then get to share in that upside along the way. So Char Next Generation is just at the beginning. It's only been since 2021. Um, but that's a little bit about the approach that we're taking and, and hoping to replicate across a number of companies. Thank you, Annalisa. Okay, so so Robin, you have a different kind of company to take us inside. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. And and I had three, and I'm going to pick the one that I love the best. This is a great story in my mind. <clears throat> Global Foundries, it, so all publicly publicly traded companies and all their plans have been publicly filed, but. Uh, Global Foundries is a multinational semiconductor company, not very common with semiconductors, but multinational is important in the context of what I'm going to describe. And in their case, they were going public in 2021, just like probably almost every company, and they wanted to infuse a culture of ownership globally, making sure that the program was inclusive. And so what we did was said, OK, you have a global organization. A tax qualified employee stock purchase plan isn't really going to work to achieve that because it would only be beneficial for people in the US. So we introduced a non-qualified program with a really generous match of 20%. And that maybe isn't all that special, but there are some really special, special components to the program because with a non-qualified program, Oftentimes, a barrier to participation is being taxed at purchase. And so the company was very passionate about making sure that there were no concerns by the participants in connection with the, tax, the taxable event at purchase. And they introduced a net settlement, a, a net settlement feature. 
and that really helped employees overcome any sort of fears that they might have had about the tax withholding obligation at purchase. And that unified program applied across the board, across the world. The best part about this program, though, is, is my favorite. In connection with the IPO, anybody who enrolled in the program also got 50 seed shares. And when we say fee, f seed shares, I'm talking about effectively RSUs. So you got 50 seed shares if you enrolled, and they vested six months after the Per, after the initial offering period. The initial offering period was six months. So all, all they had to do was basically enroll in the program, and then six months later, they got 50 vested RSUs, which amounted to about $3,000. And this was offered to almost every employee in the organization. So it was a, a way to encourage people to get in the program. And then inertia took in, or took over effectively, to allow people to just kind of continue to get their uh, their savings built through those seed shares and then remain in the program because they found it so valuable. And because this program was so successful, any new joiners after that initial IPO also were offered that initial seed share because the company wanted to do right by any sort of new joiners and just help amplify participation. So I think the takeaway here was that this company was really committed to making sure that employees had a really great experience with this program. and in getting people in that program at the start so that they could continue on throughout the duration of, of the program. And, and, and actually, the outcome was, I think, 85% participation and average contributions to the plan were about, I think, 8 to 10%. And what's common in the industry on average participation in these programs are somewhere around 30%, and average contributions are about 6%. So they killed it. And the seed share concept really helped get people interested in the program and gave them a little bit of a boost as well. So uh, we were really proud of it. We won a, a, a global equity organization award for the program. GEO is an industry association, and, and the program was just recognized for our most innovative and creative plan design. So we're really proud of it, and I think they have about 15,000 employees worldwide. Thank you very much. And it, it's, it's not a, a, a trifle to manage the legal and accounting issues across multiple countries sure. and treat everybody fairly. Uh, Eric, take us into the nitty gritty of the driver's cooperative and give us some of the feeling of uh, how the employee ownership issues developed and shook out. Absolutely. Um, I think it might help first provide a little bit of context um, of who our members are and why drivers came together to start this thing. Um, so in New York City, the for hire vehicle industry, which encompasses taxis, rideshare companies, green cabs, et cetera, um, employs around 100,000 people, um, about 85,000 of whom are driving for two, uh, a duopoly, Uber and Lyft. Um, it's a 91% immigrant workforce, almost entirely people of color. Um, the, and the problems that workers face is that Uber and Lyft have a business model, uh, which actually comes from the taxi industry originally, so it's not quite fair to pin this all on those two companies, um, which classifies workers as independent contractors, which means they're exempted from all protections of US labor law. It means there's no social safety net, no unemployment benefits. Uh, there is a workers' comp system that was created through labor advocacy over the years. Um, and there's immense pressure on workers' wages. And so um, it's a piece rate system where you get paid per trip uh, So it, in, every morning. Uh, and it's a system where drivers are already putting up most of the capital needed for the industry to function in the form of their vehicles and insurance for their vehicles. Um, there's been a long class struggle over who pays the insurance costs. And right now, workers have lost that struggle. Anyway, um, so at the beginning of every day, a driver starts out below zero. They're in the red um, for the cost that they have to front for their vehicle, whether they own it, whether they bought it and have a, a note that they're paying off, or if they're renting a vehicle, it's even worse. And then you have to hope over the course of the day, whether you're a yellow cab driver looking out for street hails, or whether you're an app-based driver waiting for your phone to give you an alert, that you get enough trips that pay you enough money to keep you busy enough to make to at least break even and come out ahead. And so the 
consequence of this is a sweatshop on wheels system where drivers work longer, where there's where drivers work longer and longer hours in order to make their minimums. Uh, when work dries up, this is not a conventionally employed workforce. Normally, like for example in the pandemic, where there's a ma essentially a mass layoff because trip volumes plummeted because people weren't leaving their homes. Uh, normally, W-2 workers would get dislocated worker assistance, unemployment. All of those things are a fight for, for drivers to, to win. So um, I began working in this sector in 2017. Um, I was hired as education director of a labor organization. My background had been labor organizing and teaching, so I could check all the boxes. Um, and at that point, I was already quite interested in co-ops because of the experiences I've had and seen where unions weren't able to move the needle. Um, and this industry is clearly primed for this kind of structure, uh, being an industry of independent contractors. There's a long history of workers trying to solve their own problems by building co-ops. So the idea was in the air. Um, any driver you talk to would say, a union, that'd be great, but what we really need is to own our own app. And so, dutiful union staffer that I was, decided to do what I could to make the dream come true. Um, happened to see an email from Allison Powers at Capital Impact Partners, who's sitting in the back of the room here, looking for uh, interest, innovative co-op ideas. And so, applied for a grant to create a participatory action research project, which is a fancy word for a class, about how could worker ownership change this industry? And put out a call, hundreds of drivers responded. We had to have an election for the limited spots, limited seats in the class, provide a stipend for drivers to take time off the road to uh, be part of a discussion, to vision and dream and figure out the feasibility of starting a co-op. Um, so I was working for a labor NGO, starting businesses was outside their lane. So the class ended, and I set off on my own with the core group of drivers to, to build the company. Uh, the pandemic hit a few months later, um, and this was an interesting moment because a lot of drivers were staying home, huge fights with Uber. Uh, they launched this bogus, uh, I won't even go into it. Um, <laughs> But drivers had time, and fortunately, were able to get unemployment benefits. They had time to be on Zoom meetings, to discuss, to think, to reflect, to plan. And so, um, together with a core group, incorporated the business and began putting the pieces together. It took about a year to raise the capital to get started. Uh, we had about as much money as Uber had when they started. You might be surprised. Any guesses how much that was? $300,000. Does that sound like enough to start a rideshare company in New York? It's not. Uh, the, I, I won't go into all the nitty gritty details, but you, you basically need five things to make a transportation company go. You need drivers, you need riders, you need technology, you need people who know how to put those things together or bring those things together to turn it into a going concern, and you need capital to pay those people and to pay for all the costs of assembling the other inputs. Of those five things, we only had one, uh, which was drivers, and so we had to figure it out for everything else. So the whole, the whole project has been a classic example of bootstrapping. Uh, we took what we had to figure out how to get what we didn't have. Um, we used a lot of social movement strategies like crowdfunding. Um, I could go into a lot more detail, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but to, to make a very long story short, um, we didn't have money for great tech, so we got an app for $10,000. Um, that app was a pretty good investment. We generated about six million dollars in revenue from that ten thousand dollar app um, but there are also limits to what it could do um, we were early on i think a lot of funders were skeptical because it seemed like we were taking on a pretty big fight um, and so we, we struggled but we managed to we got grants that allowed us now to build our own app which we have released uh, as of you can download it. it's called co-op ride that's the core piece of infrastructure that will also allow us to replicate this model all across the world. And so we're actively looking at franchising as the mechanism for global growth. Um, and I could say a lot more. Maybe the one last thing I'll say is the, the core business problem is what they call network effects, which is if you've got a lot of riders who are requesting trips, but you don't have a lot of drivers on the road, the riders will churn and say, this thing doesn't work. If you have a lot of drivers who go online and they don't get trip requests, they say, oh, this thing doesn't have a trip request. So how do you get both of those things at the same same place at the same time. The strategy we've been using has been to uh, build a network through a market niche uh, called paratransit, which is um, providing transportation for people with disabilities and medical transportation, both of which are 
billion, well, multi-hundred million dollar markets in New York City. Um, and so we've become a leading provider of transportation for people with disabilities in New York, um, which is another great way to achieve impact. It's also a very low road industry with a ton of problems. Um, so our, our technology has been customized around that use case. Uh, and we're really proud that we've been able to both pr make a difference for people who need mobility the most and provide what you could call social mobility for drivers who tell us they're making more money than they've ever made in their lives, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, I process the 1099s and like that's a beautiful thing to hear, but like when people are making $45,000 a year and this is the most money they've made in their lives, it's like this country needs to change, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to do something a little differently uh, and uh, open it up for some questions uh, uh, from uh, from the group right now. Uh, but I would like to have the questions balanced among the four the four participants. So if we get a question for one person, we're not going to get a second question for that person until we go through all four. Everybody has a lot to say, important cases, and we want everybody to discuss all of the cases. So any questions? Um, I'm curious about your governance structure, given several thousand members, or at least a thousand members? Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time on Zoom uh, the, with the large meeting add-on. No, I'm to, well, we do. But uh, yeah, so we've our structure is similar to a lot of co-ops of this scale, where members elect a board of directors. Our board of directors is multi-stakeholder, uh, because you need, of course, drivers are the key stakeholder, but staff are also an important constituency, and we want them to have a voice and have good jobs, too. Uh, so the, there's a multi-stakeholder board, uh, which hires a management team, which hires a staff. Both the staff and drivers vote for representation on the board. I will say one of the challenges of co-ops is like, who's accountable to who? Uh, everyone is accountable to everybody else. But who's accountable to who at what moment in time is an ongoing discussion and point of debate and uh, a difficult uh, thing to negotiate sometimes. But it seems to be working. Um, yeah, it seems to be working. Okay, a question for one of our other three panelists. Graham. Chris, I think it is. I'm very interested in the... Chris, uh, it's Graham Nuttall. Um, very interested in your acquisitions model. And just wondered if you could say a bit about how you incorporate different brands, divisions, and the new workers that are coming in, and how you get the culture right for everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the interesting things about a holding company model um, is we can go find great businesses, bring them into our family of businesses, but we don't have an intention to take over and run the companies. We want to empower leadership teams and the employees of those companies to continue to, to run them as they have you know, been running them with the addition of kind of plussing up the culture, adding the employee ownership component. Um, so not trying to change cultures, just trying to evolve it. Um, and that's, you know, with the holding company approach, we've already done that m many times now. Um, so they don't have to go through the long effort of figuring out how to, f how to be an employee-owned company on their own. Um, so it kind of reduces that risk that so many talk about with acquisitions of, you know, integration risk and, you know, culture risk is the number one reason acquisitions fail. We think and find that, especially in a diversified hold co model where each business is kept separate uh, as much as possible, it kind of helps with that. But you're still creating like a peer group ultimately of company leaders, even cross-functional leaders like HR. You can create peer groups like with HR, marketing, whatever. Um, so they can feel like they're part of a family, um, or they call each other sister companies, or you know, or cousins. Sorry, cousin companies is what they call each other. Um, so they feel like they're part of something. They feel like they're part of something, um, but they don't have to fully integrate those cultures. I don't know if that helps. Okay, so a question for uh, Annalisa or Robin, please. Hi, so Annalisa, um, I guess my question is how easy it is to get other private equity firms to um, to buy into the broad-based employee ownership story. Is it enough to show them that improve, it improves employee engagement and performance, or do you think the LPs need to step up and pro provide some pressure on the back end? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's, 
It's all of the above. It's not easy to convince people to do this at all. And when we started back in August of 2021 having these conversations, we talked about the social impact, the wealth gap, lack of employee engagement across the country as an epidemic. And we also talked about the potential business case around improving engagement, decreasing turnover, um, operational improvements, et cetera. Um, we've actually very rapidly built a pension fund leadership council. So Allison Tucker, the CEO of the Washington State Investment Board, heard Pete Stavros, our founder, present um, at a forum. And she got really interested, and she said, what can I do to help? So she was the first person who came to the table, then CalPERS, then New York Common. And that was really influential. That sort of changed the conversation a little bit, because I think you know some of the GPs felt, OK, well, if our investors are going to start asking us about this, then we might want to take it a little bit seriously. So I would say that, that that was a presence from the very beginning. We thought we would launch with maybe five or six private equity firms as partners. and the ones that were a little bit more socially minded. So we were in conversation with like a, a private equity firm that had former union leadership. But um, I think as the movement started to grow and other stakeholders got involved, we were able to accelerate and launch with 19 private equity firms and now 25. So it's not easy and it does take a lot of different voices, um, um, you know, talking amongst themselves to say, Let's give this a right a chance. This is the right thing to do, and and it can also be good for business. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let's have a question for Robin about the publicly traded company model. Go ahead, Marshall. Yeah, I'm just curious if you could share when companies come to you looking for help. What is the main challenge, or what are the challenges that they're facing, and how you go about helping them with those? Well, currently, thank you, Marshall, and it's good to see you again. <laughs> uh, so I think today we're seeing companies who are faced with heavy share dilution and they are dealing with low stock prices and having to reel back on eligibility. And it's really unfortunate right now. And so a fix is potentially introducing an ESPP, an employee stock purchase plan. But as we know, that often comes with the participant actually having to contribute their own funds. So in a world where we have so much excessive executive compensation, to me, taking away from the broad-based population is not the right answer. And introducing an ESPP is a wonderful addition, but I, I think we could take away from some of the executive ownership and push that down into the broader organization rather than limiting eligibility. So today, to answer your question, what we're seeing is how can we limit eligibility or reel back on the amount of equity that we're granting our broad-based organization at this point because we're, we're faced with a, a, just a share kind of crisis, low share prices, and that, that's not the answer in my mind. So that's kind of the top, the top uh, area of focus today with companies struggling and, and seeing their stock prices decline after having gone public and high valuations. Thank you, Robin. Okay, so I think we're going to do an, another round of questions uh, for our panelists, and then they know this is coming. <laughs> I'm going to ask them the big question that they've been warned they're going to be asked two weeks ago. Uh, so let's do another round of questions for our four panelists. Uh, go ahead. This is a question for Eric. Um, it's actually two quick questions. One is just, do you know about Empower DC, which I think is a similar model in DC? It, do, is it? Yeah, OK. And the, the second is just about the $300,000 you said of capital that you raised. W where did you raise that from, and what did the providers of capital receive in, re in, in exchange for the capital that they provide? Uh, OK, I'll take the first question first. Yeah, the, uh, the company you mentioned, um, I think, if it is the company I'm thinking of, uh, no, not a similar model. There, it's, it's a, I don't know if it's venture backed, but it's an entirely privately owned rideshare company, which lets drivers set their own prices. Uh, this is an idea that's kind of 
always bouncing around. It's a non-solution to the problems of the gig economy. I mean, that just essentially incentivizes drivers to go back to haggling with the rider about the fare, which is not going to result in earnings. I mean, essentially, it's an everyone for themselves sort of free market model. Um, and not to get too political, but I, like economically speaking, that's going to result in potentially downward pressure on wages as uh, drivers try to underbid each other. That happened in New York. It's why the taxi industry is regulated now. In the 30s, that's exactly what happened. It's why the medallion system was created, which created a whole other set of problems. Um, but yeah, no, Empower is not a driver-owned company. Um, and from what I can tell, I get notifications of them constantly saying wait times are decreasing, which I think reflects some of the problem that uh, a lot of uh, challengers trying to break into rideshare face, which is that they try to go into frontal competition with uh, the big rideshare companies, realize that you need to have a gigantic network. Uh, they don't. And then they usually retreat into providing pre-scheduled trips and doing B2B. We sort of saw that, and so we decided to flip it and said, OK, we're going to do B2B and B2G first, use that to build our network, use it as a foundation to build a profitable business, and then from there, launch into the uh, B2C segment, which is much larger. Um, yeah. So that was, I guess, the first question. Uh, the second question was, sorry. Where did you get your capital? Capital. Yeah. Um, Really, really challenging to raise capital for this business. I think this is just going, taking us back in time to 2020. 2020. Um, the sources of funding, venture capital, they're looking for, got to go faster? Oh, sorry. Uh, so where do you get money to start a business? You could go to, for tech companies, it's venture capital, who are looking for a specific structure of ownership, where they're buying equity and then um, exiting through a secondary sale somewhere down the road. Um, that's not really compatible without a lot of tinkering with what we were trying to do as a co-op. Um, also, for VCs, with other things coming across their desk, it's very unlikely that a driver on rideshare company is going to be the most, is going to kind of fit the profile of what they're looking for. Other sources, you know, people go to the SBA. We could have done that. They require a personal guarantee. That was something that we had an adventure with later in our trajectory. Um, not really viable at that. We wanted to avoid that because it was pretty high risk um, at the very beginning. Um, the other main source co-ops get their capital from is co-op loan funds, which are wonderful, but most of their lending is oriented towards financing assets, which can sort of collateralize themselves, like buying a piece of machinery, for example, uh, or expand or working capital to expand an existing business. So they're not really set up to fund startups and don't have the sort of risk return profile on their products that would, would fit. Then another source of capital would be foundation would be grants. Um, in 2020, we had a hard time uh, sort of getting foundations to understand our story and to understand not just the solution we were proposing. They had a hard time believing the solution and thinking that this was going to be successful uh, as a business. But they also, for a lot of them, had a hard time understanding the problem, the the myth that. Uber and its ilk are providing great, fun, flexible gig work that helps people boost their income runs pretty deep. And I mean, I think that that myth has been successfully, fairly successfully debunked at this point. But going back in time, that was still pretty strong with a lot of folks who, to be blunt, you would think knew better. Um, we got to kind of wrap sorry. the right, answer yeah. up. Yeah. So we, we eventually, we got a loan from Shared Capital Cooperative, which is a co-op loan fund, who took a risk on us. We also had developed a product line, and I can't go into detail, which could reasonably project uh, more stable um, uh, business projections. Um, and then a couple other co-op loan funds and crowdfunding. OK, thank you. So I'm uh, <clears throat> now told we have five minutes left. So I am going to ask the big question. Uh, well, thinking about the corporation broadly, and the future of the corporation doesn't have to look like what it looks like now. And thinking about the five to six thousand companies listed on the Nasdaq and the New York Stock Exchange, you know, what does the model that you are working on? And we have four different models. Bode for redesigning the future of the corporation, especially larger corporations in the United States. We'll take about a minute each, and again, we'll go from the right to the left. Chris. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I think, you know, it's 
I'm not qualified to answer that question. So, um, but I'll do your best. <laughs> um, our model, you know, employee owned hold co a lot of the benefits and power in what we're doing is truly just what we've been talking about the last two days. All the reasons employee ownership is great and has terrific outcomes for people. Um, so thinking about how that scales, I really just start to dream about what an employee owned Berkshire Hathaway would look like. I mean, can you imagine basically? Um, so I'll leave you with that. In my wildest dreams, we somehow create something like that someday. Can you have a chocolate subsidiary too? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Annalisa. Um, well, we'd love to see public companies routinely include meaningful, broad-based employee ownership programs and think that that would truly take us from a place of shareholder primacy to stakeholder capitalism, and that these programs are not just part of a benefits package that the employees maybe don't know about or understand, but that these companies are really building robust cultures of ownership, which is what we all want, where the management structures reflect the things that need to be in place for employees to really have delegated decision making and really have a voice in making the workplace better and to maybe they're in a job that didn't, you know, they didn't intend this wasn't like the dream career, but they have purpose in their work, they have a voice, they feel connected to the job because they are interacted in a way where they are treated and able to act like owners. So it's, it's a vision we all want, but baked into public companies um, in a more, you know, sustainable way. Thank you, Annalisa. Robin. I, I'm very aligned with what you just said, Annalisa. So for me, I think companies really need to put in some thoughtful design levers in their programs that can really amplify participation and get creative with their offerings. Because the programs that I was planning to talk about today in more depth all were a little bit creative and, and had design levers that can really enable and boost participation in their programs. And so being be, doing that, I think, will ultimately help bring us to another level of employee ownership. It, I'm, it's just unfortunate because so many times we're faced with conversations with clients who want to design these really fabulous programs, but when all is said and done, they don't want to put the right design levers in place to actually make that happen. So I, I think that, and then that coupled with just really, really important communication education for participants because like Marshall talked about earlier, that is such a miss for companies. The two go hand in hand. You design a program and that program from end to end should include communications about how wonderful the program is and it should be ongoing. And that just is such a miss for people. They don't want to spend the money on it. And, and so I, I think some of that can really help bring us to a better place. And gosh, don't you think we all behave so much different if we're an owner of something versus a renter? I don't care as deeply about something that I rent. So I, I just think that's my overarching message of like why ownership is so important. Eric? Um, it's so funny. I had to think of this question a lot. Um, and I actually realized I actually did work for a large publicly traded company that did have an employee ownership program. It paid around minimum wage. Uh, provided benefits. You were at 20 hours, but strategically scheduled people for 19, and uh, arbitrarily fired people. Um, I was part of a campaign to unionize that company and got fired for doing so. The company's name is Starbucks. So it really made me. I'm, I'm not bringing this up because I want to like smear their name or whatever, but the it's because we got to think not just how do you get big public traded companies to embrace ownership, but what does it actually mean? Something I think that I've kind of my eyes have opened to is I've sort of gone from being a radical labor organizer to being a Republican um, as a someone <laughs> responsible for I'm not a Republican as a joke, uh, but <laughs> the maybe like anyway I'm not going to go there uh, to being responsible for making sure like that payroll gets processed and there's enough money in the bank is um, that business owners do things for a reason and the reason that Starbucks was making the decisions to run their business in that way it does have to do with the ownership. So what does that mean? I actually don't know. But here's an idea. I think, I think the answer might be to leverage labor's pension fund assets to use those to finance worker-owned businesses. I, why not? You know, I don't know if there's, yeah. Or just stop financing really terrible businesses for that, for that matter. 
Well, that, that's fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> I will remind everyone that in his first State of the Union address, President Theodore Roosevelt, who was really a Republican, called for broad-based employee ownership and profit sharing, as did President Reagan during his administration. And so with that, let me thank this fantastic panel, helping us look forward to the future of the corporation. Thank you so much. That was great.